The nights are getting longer. Days are getting colder. Light is leaving the world. We like to have it back, please. That's what Advent is for. Advent is a time of year where we get ready for the birth of the child of light. And it's kind of universally celebrated, though in different ways and in different customs and for very different reasons around the world. So as we're getting ready for the start of Advent, maybe we should talk a little bit about why we celebrate this, because it's more about us than it is opening little boxes on a calendar or lighting candles for a couple weeks. Let's talk about why to celebrate Advent today as we walk together down creation's paths. Hello everyone, my name is Charlie. I am a Christopagan Druid and Priest of Bridget. Hello everyone, my name is Brian. I am a Christopagan Druid and sous chef to the doctor. Today we're going to be talking about Advent. Well, the fairly Christopagan take on Advent, as well as other things that we should bear in mind with the, oh, I almost said with the advent of this holiday. Oh, I'm going to try not to do puns on its own name throughout this thing, but the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Like I try not to pun, but it is my natural means of communication. It doesn't help that I'm in the background going, but why though? This is a biggie and I, it's one I don't think is well understood. It doesn't get the publicity that Lent does because, well, punish yourself for over a month. It just has more cultural cachet with us than this. Which, by the way, used to be a penitential season and for some people still is. But we'll talk about that in a minute. Before we get into all of this. If you haven't already, don't forget to like, subscribe, follow, whatever the terminology happens to be on the app that you're listening to us on. It helps us out, but also we do five original Christopagan and Druid related episodes every week, Monday through Friday, and you don't want to miss a thing because we've got a lot of stuff coming up. All right, so let's just get into it. Advent is not Christmas. It leads up to Christmas, but Christmas is its own 12-day holiday that happens later in the year. So is it prep work for Christmas? Okay, so in the olden days, when the Imperial Church took over and enslaved the souls of man and beast alike so that they could have ultimate and true control over our spirituality, not that I'm bitter or have any hurt feelings about it, they decided to add a whole bunch of nonsense into the Christian faith. And a big part of that was the idea of penance. Penance appears nowhere until about the third century. I feel like this is really important to say. Penance doesn't really appear until D the DCN persecution, because this is the famous one that if you've heard about any of the persecutions of the early church, this, this one is probably the one that you've heard about, either this or the Diocletian one. So what ha happened was Rome believed the emperor was a god. To keep good order, you needed to sacrifice incense to the deified emperor. And so they did this thing that you may have read about in the book of Revelation, where to be able to buy or sell anything, you had to go and offer incense to the emperor and get your ticket that said that you offered incense to the emperor and then show that to be able to buy things in the market or to get the free bread because the Roman empire actually fed most of their people and gave them free bread. Or of low-cost bread. Yeah, that, you might remember that from the book of Revelation. It's one of the things that that book is railing about, is that you had to have the mark of the beast to buy or sell. This is what they're talking about there. And a bunch of Christians who didn't want to go hungry just threw some incense on the fire, like the Apostle Paul told them to. Because the Apostle Paul says, if you look at a statue and you know that there's nothing there but a statue, go ahead and throw some incense on the fire because you know that you are, in fact, not doing anything. But of course, why are they going to read their own scriptures that they're putting together? It's fine. And so in reaction to this, what are you going to do with all the people that are now like, yeah, I threw some incense on the altar, but I'm still a Christian. Well, you create this thing called penance and make it worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. Because Jesus just said, you're forgiven. And James said, confess your sins to one another and forgive them. No one said anything about having to do things. But of course, all of those who didn't offer the incense and went through the hard times wanted to punish the people who listened to the Apostle Paul and offered the incense anyway. Thus, the idea of penance was born. And well, if we're going to make them have penance for this, well, 
maybe, yeah, your sins are forgiven when you convert, but you have to do penance to work off the bad energies that you've generated from doing the bad things prior to that. And penitential seasons came into being. There were a lot of them. Lent is the most famous where you fast leading up to the crucifixion of Christ. Advent was another where you would fast in the lead up to Christmas. And uh, because they didn't have enough, they scattered a whole bunch of other ones throughout the calendar. So if you're Catholic, you will actually see your priest start wearing the colors of penance during this time period because, yes, you are supposed to be fasting. Yeah, no. See, as somebody who has actually read the Gospels, I feel like that's a very important thing if you're going to call yourself a Christian. Jesus said that you don't deprive yourselves of the company of the king when you were in the presence of the king. When he was asked why his followers didn't fast, yeah. he was like, why? Why would they? When you're at a party, you don't refuse to take part in the party. It's, it's rude. I'm a crazy kind of Christian. I believe that we should, you know, listen to Jesus. But that's just me, apparently. I look at Advent much in the same way I look at Lent as something that was created with bad intent, but that has a very useful purpose for us today. This is something that we can and should reconstruct and something that I reconstructed many, many years ago for myself. And look at this as our chance to be our own little Marys, our own little John the Baptist, clearing the way. To me, this is a time period for us to spend the four weeks-ish, depending on where Christmas falls through, the four weeks of Advent that precede Christmas and the, the whatever time remaining up to Christmas Day, meditating and getting ready for the birth of the child of light, getting ready for the birth of the Christ child. While I am not the kind of pseudo-Christian who believes that you never ask forgiveness for anything that you did wrong, I don't believe that you have to punish yourself for all time and eternity because you asked for forgiveness for what you did wrong. Kind of a literal application of dealing with the law of returning tides. If you throw trash into the ocean, there's a chance it might wash back upon yourself or it may float around and end up somewhere else. The law of returning tide says it may come back, it may not, it may come back differently. Maybe a message in a bottle of somebody you need to go help to come back as, or uh, some driftwood that you need for fire, and it actually is something helpful. But along that, you don't just go out in the ocean, troll a bunch of trash, and pile it upon yourself and waller in it in suffering, right? thinking you're going to make it better to make amends for the bit of trash you threw in there. That said... As a chef, I understand and highly value the importance of prep work, of doing prep work and preparing yourself for a big event. And so, yeah, I get that. Spending that extra time in preparation for the big holiday. Well, th this is the value of these seasons is in the reconstruction work that we're doing, trying to figure out what the kernel is, what is the good thing in here. I think it's important for us to remember that we are the children of God and the mothers of God. As Paul says, I continue to struggle in labor with you until Christ is born in you. Our purpose, our work really on the, in the Christian side of things is to bring Christ into the world, to live the, as the body of Christ, to bring that cosmic Christ energy that holds all things together, that brings life and healing and forgiveness and mercy and justice into the world. It's easy for us to forget that. That to me is what these holidays are for. That's what these prep times are for, is to remind ourselves of our purpose and our work. That's why the reconstruction part of this, if for the individual practitioner you want to fast, in and of itself there's nothing wrong in that, but you have to look at why you want to fast. If you're fasting just because you're fasting, that's faffery probably maybe not. If you're fasting because of penance and you need to waller in this suffering, that's self-harm. That's not good. Don't do that. But if you're fasting as an exercise of humility and prepping yourself so that you can occupy the space you're supposed to occupy, like say whatever you're going to fast, you're giving up something that maybe you have too much of, then, then fasting is okay. But you have to take the moment to reconstruct that in your mind to understand why you're choosing to fast. When I say that this is our time to be the John the Baptist, John's ministry is recorded in the scripture was to prepare the way for the Lord, to prepare the way for Christ. And this time period 
these four weeks plus so many days is a time for us to remind ourselves of what we were talking about. That we're talking about the divine wisdom that played with God in the beginning, that played with God in the beginning. I, 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 stru- try, I know people think I, I might stress that too much, but again, we have this super serious idea of religion and spirituality and wisdom, which is probably the most super serious thing that we talk about, right? Because wisdom is sober. Wisdom played before God. If your wisdom doesn't play, your wisdom isn't wisdom. Let's go say that flat out. Your wisdom needs to be playful. But this incarnation of this wisdom that played before God at the beginning of creation, this light that is the life of all people, that it is in us and born in us and through us into the world, that this is what we are celebrating in the return of the child of light on December 25th, that this is a time for us to be reminded of all of the things that make this time period special. It is a time for us to remember the great work that we are all individually and collectively called to. That is the perfection of ourselves and the restoration and reparation of the world to bring the world into a state of perfect balance where there is justice and harmony. Not everyone is the same, because again, you can fight with Hegel on a lot of things, but he was very right when he pointed out that unity requires diversity, that if everyone agrees that that is conformity, not unity. And so my image of the Christ child will necessarily be different from your vision of the Christ child, your understanding of the Christ child, your understanding of the cosmic Christ and your relationship to it. By celebrating the time of Advent, it is a time for us to take these four weeks and really ask ourselves, what is our relationship to this? What is our relationship to the man Jesus, to our co-redeemer Mary? What is our relationship to the cosmic Christ that, as Paul says, holds the universe together? For many of us who may be worried about the difficult times we may be entering into, in the next four years, it's also a time to just reflect upon that story of the persecution that happened after the birth, where they had to flee their home country into Egypt just to avoid their child being murdered. Maybe a time of just reflection upon that aspect of things and what, how that relates to your life and what you may be facing or your neighbors might be facing. Christianity and Judaism, well, Judaism, not so much, but especially Christianity, like to forget that they are born out of refugee narratives. The Exodus, which is core to both, is a refugee narrative. It is people breaking free from slavery, becoming refugees until they find and settle a new homeland. Christianity shares this origin story in the person of Jesus, that he was a refugee, that he had to flee as an infant between the age of birth and two years old, had to flee to Egypt lived in exile in Egypt for a time, and then returned. I can't think of a better analogy for us in our modern era, this idea of God's exile. Because if you're somebody like me who sees the Christ child as divine, right? The incarnation of God. Yeah, God often has to flee in the face of tyranny so that something can survive of it. That our good works have to be either hidden or done in the secret places. And it leads many to ask questions. And I think a lot of people are asking those questions. Where was your God way? I think Advent is the time to ask those questions because this is a time where, remember the context of the story. If you're going to play with any myth, with any legend, with any of these holidays, you do it within the context of the story because it tells you everything that you need to practice it. The area was under imperial control. The Greeks conquered, followed by the Romans conquered. And the Romans were not good to be subjugated by. We misunderstand a lot of the teachings of Jesus when he says, if somebody asks for your clothes, give them your coat also. If somebody asks you to carry their things for a mile, carry it for them too. See, a Roman soldier, a Roman legionary, had the right, the legal right, to walk up to you and say, I want your coat. I want it. Give it to me. And you had to give it to them. They could hand you their equipment and say, carry this for me. And you were legally obligated to carry for at least a mile 
what they handed you. That was the law. This was an oppressive regime that Christianity came into being in the middle of. Where was God in all of this? Well, God was in Mary. God was in many of the other Hasidim running around in Israel at the time, in Judea and Galilee. There were no shortage of miracle workers in the area. People that were helping others through. People that were rising up and revolting. When Jesus was just 12, the neighboring city of Sepphoris was burned to the ground. And if you notice how many people were slaughtered and crucified because of a rebellion that happened within sight of his home village. Like he and his family would have seen the smoke rising from Sepphoris for days when he was just a child. It was a time of turmoil. What Jesus took from this, the human Jesus took from this, is that the way forward is to take care of each other and to do everything in our power to relieve the oppressed, to bring relief to the crushed. I love that phrase, to bring relief to the crushed, to be a healer, to make life better in whatever ways we can. That to me is the message of Advent. If the gospel is us for proclaiming sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf and the acceptable year of the Lord, right? Then Advent is the time where we are rededicating ourselves to all of that, that we are here to bring about those changes. As a Kusto pagan, we learn from all of them that there is a season unto everything. This is why we don't go out and try to do delicate garden work and pruning in the middle of the night on a new moon. Because it's too dark to see what the hell we're doing. We wait for daylight and then we do our gardening and our pruning. That's common sense. We need to remember that there are going to be these seasons. Sometimes it's time to be doing the work. Sometimes it's time to sit back and rest and recuperate or re remember things. It staggers me how many Christians are familiar with the parable of the good Samaritan. They could tell you all about it, but they don't know it. They don't remember it. You'll see the very same person going on about it, like just turning up their nose when somebody's in need of help and stuff. But it's not that we help beyond our means because each of us have our means and we have what help we can give, but we forget. It's a refugee religion. We come from this place where we remember that community is where the strength is. Yes. That some are blessed and able to help more than others and each individual is able to help in the way that they can help and that we don't expect everyone to help in the same way to participate in the same way and to do the same thing yeah. for instance we started off talking earlier we talked we're talking about being mindful of our intention if we're going to engage in fasting i, I don't do the others to do it and stuff but oftentimes people are like you don't fast. I never see you fasting. And for myself, because I often and easily can get lost in things, can get hyper-focused in stuff, I'm still fasting for Advent by taking time and setting time aside, making it sacred by setting it aside to remember and prepare myself for, for Christmas and the coming Christ. I am fasting of my time. Yeah. It's not as obvious. Yeah. But it's my personal way of doing it. And ever as a priest of Bridget, this is a special time for me. I love seeing people's faces every time I tell them this because their their eyes go a little crossed when they try to think about it. Bridget, according to the Irish tradition and the Scottish tradition and the Welsh tradition, was the foster mother of Christ. Bridget was the midwife who helped bring Christ into the world. And then you see people starting to try to piece this together and not understanding again how story works how mythology works how all of this works Brigid is a triple goddess she is the goddess of the forge and the craftsman she's the goddess of the poet the goddess of judgment and truth and many other things like you're gone forever to see her embodying this person who would go bad and be there with mary i do i believe that there was literally an irish celt that happened to be in Bethlehem, that if you're asking those questions, you've missed the point. There's a time for discussing literal, historical, whatever. But when we're dealing with these things on the level of spirituality and practice, we're not talking about literal history. We're asking ourselves, well, why would you say that? What does it mean that you're saying that? These are places and times to enter mystery and to seek 
that energy, that wisdom, that power that's in the mystery. This is a period of time where I'm really thinking about this, of this Irish Celtic goddess being there in that cave, the traditional birthplace of Hughes is correct, or in that downstairs where they kept the animals, whichever it was, but Bridget being there, helping to bring the Christ child into the world. It's a story that makes sense. Bridget is a midwife. Bridget was often invoked at times of pregnancy and childbirth. One of the most powerful images to me is this image of Mick. Bridget holding the newborn Christ and dipping her hand in water and praying the blessing of three waves over the Christ child, which is something we will be talking about a little bit later, because this is probably going to be become a part of my Christmas practice issue because it's an image that I just can't get out of my head. This is a very traditional prayer said over newborns to bring them into the world. If you're asking yourself, did this literally happen? They get, you've missed the point. This is why I giggle to myself every time Charlie mentions this and, the, and then I watch somebody's eyes go across. And after I'm done giggling, I, I stay quiet because I'm like, man, they're really not ready to share my further thoughts on that. Because along that same line, I sit back and I go, nobody ever talked about the chef at the end. There's a chef. There's a cook. There's somebody cooking. There's staff that are helping to clean. And I'm like, Dante was also there. You think about the, the three tools. Prosperity is brought into the world on that very day, in that very moment. That was prosperity. That was life everlasting. They were given life and life abundant. The second tool. And harmony. The whole thing was very harmonious. And uh, maybe I should just start saying, oh, yeah, and Dante was hanging out too. Think about it. The child the sleep. Yeah. So why yeah. celebrate? Yeah. Why celebrate Advent? Because we need to prepare ourselves. We need to make sure that we're ready to enter mystery because we as a society have forgotten how to work with mystery and how to enter into mystery. While we're celebrating the mystery on the 25th or the 21st or from the 25th through January 6th, which is how we will be doing it, then you have to get ready. You have to start asking yourself, what does this period of time mean to you? What do you want it to mean to you? What do you want from the mystery? What do you need to glean from the mystery? Do you just need to reconnect to the light that there is hope? I know a lot of people, that's what they're needing right now. And if that's what you need, then that's what you need and more power to you. Now's the time to start asking yourselves and start making your plan. So we're going to be probably not going as full bore in for Advent as we did for Samhain, but we're going to be doing some more episodes about getting ready for Advent and getting ready for Christmas and a few actually for Advent to the time period leading up to Christmas, because this is a very important time of year for us. So we'd love to know any questions that you have. What would you like us to talk about? You can leave us a comment if you're listening to us on Spotify or YouTube right there, right where you're listening to us. If you're listening to us anywhere else, even if they say that you can leave a comment, they don't let us know. So you can leave a comment there because engagement is mattered. But then head over to creationsfast.com, click on chat, where you can leave us a comment there. We will see it and be able to respond. I would love to know what more about this season would you like to know or any other topics you would like us to cover. In a lot of ways, I am looking forward to this Advent and this Christmas in a way that I haven't in the past. Because, I don't know, I, I feel like something is changing. And while, yes, there are a lot of dark changes coming... I think there's also an awakening happening. I think we may be at the cusp of another great awakening, but this time one that doesn't lead to patriarchy and violence. Wouldn't that be lovely? We'll see. As we're heading out today, I would just like to say a little prayer to Bridget. Oh, Bridget, foster mother of Christ, who prepared the way, who teaches us to work at the forge and to speak the words of power and truth in this life. Help us and prepare us to enter the great mysteries as we ever strive to perfect ourselves and to repair the world. Amen. Amen. <laughs>